every bit of that, theology, theology. Everybody say theology. theology. <laughs> you know what that is, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, your belief, your study of God, yes. theo, God, yes. ology, study of. Um, it's, uh, it's what we believe. It's what we are, what, yeah. What, we, yeah. what, we, what we put our hope in, put our trust in. This is what God teaches us in his word and that's why the Bible is such a tremendously valuable tool for our lives because it teaches us all of these things. Yeah, that, yeah. Je- that there's a Father God, that he has a Son, Jesus Christ, who came and suffered and died on this earth for us, gave himself for us, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again on the third day and he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for us. Yeah. Because we have an enemy that appears before God, and day and night, the book of Revelation says, and accuses us before God. Look at them. They call themselves a Christian. Look at that. Look at that. I told you they'd never last. I told you. Look at look, uh, what the, If they really trust you, would they be doing that? Look at that. There. Devil just accusing, 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 accusing every day. As, as a matter of fact, one of the titles of the devil is the accuser of the brethren. But you have a mediator. You have a, you have a defense attorney there. Yes, and your defender is Jesus Christ. And your defender says, yeah, that's right. But my blood covers their sin. That's what I die for. Yeah. God says, boom, not guilty. Yeah. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, yeah. our yeah. Lord and Savior. And the Holy Spirit inhabits our life here on earth right now inside of you. If you're a child of God, there is a Holy Spirit inhabiting your life. Yeah. Sometimes people call it conscience. Sometimes they say it's that small voice inside. They have all kind of labels for it. But what it is, is the Holy Spirit of God inside of you, living inside of you. So we have a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit all operating at one time. Three in one. They all have the same purpose. They all have the same goal. They all have the same agenda. They're out of each other. They're three, but yet they're one. And it's like, how could that be? And I say, we'll know one day. The place you can see them in operation together, just so you'll know. And I'm not trying to get on a, you know, Trinity discussion here. But I do know that a lot of people, you know, to a lot of people, that's kind of a strange thought that you can have three, but yet they're, just, they're one. Um, but you can see all three of them in operation at the same time when Jesus was baptized. He goes down in the Jordan River. You remember this, right? Oh, yeah. John the Baptist is baptizing in the Jordan River, and Jesus goes in down in the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist looks at him and says, Why are you here? You should be baptized in me. And John told the people, Behold, the Lamb of God. John points him out, and Jesus said, I came that righteousness might be fulfilled. In other words, it's important that you baptize me because after all, I am a man. Yeah, yeah. Even though he was fully God, 100%, yeah, yeah. he was still fully man, 100%. He's, he's a God man. He's yeah. Jesus. He, he's the only one that's ever existed and the only one that ever will exist. He's just yeah. Jesus. And John puts him under the water and when he brings him back up, the Holy Spirit comes down and lights on his shoulder in the form of a dove and the father's voice speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Three in one. Three in one. Ice, water, and steam. Three in one. (laughs) Ice, water, and steam. (laughs) Three in one. All right. There you go. All right. That's not what we're on today. All right. So (laughs) that's just an adventure. I don't know... Somebody must have needed that today. We're in the book of Philippians. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're in the book of Philippians, and, um, and it's the joy book, right? How many of you have read all four chapters? Just, I mean, I'm not, uh, not going to make you stand up and quote anything or whatever, but just you've read all four chapters. Good, good, good. Yeah, several. Yeah, quite a few of you guys. Yeah, I would suggest that you do this. I mean, it's really, they're four short chapters. It's not going to take you forever. And uh, you can even use your iPad or your notepad or your computer or your whatever it might be, your phone. You can use all of that because the Bible's everywhere, you know. <laughs> it is. You have all kinds of websites filled with the Bible, all kinds of translations and so forth. And, uh, and you can read the Word of God just anywhere you are. And 
You read those four chapters of the book of Philippians, and you might not understand every single little detail about it, but you'll understand enough to know that this is good news, that this is joy, that this is something that is a wonderful asset to our life. And just a reminder that the Apostle Paul was writing this while he was in prison, which just makes it, to me, more impressive what it says. You know it has to be inspired by the Holy Spirit because no one who is in prison on trumped-up charges and has been for a couple of years chained between two guards that every few hours those, they change the guards, you know, and you're still sitting there in a dark dungeon in Roman prison waiting to get your head chopped off. I mean, that's not a joyful time, right? But yet, here's Paul writing the book of Philippians, the letter, a letter to a church in Philippi, real people like us in a church in Philippi where he had been on a missionary journey and had won some people to faith in the Lord and they had started a church and now it's an organized deal and they have church and he's writing them a letter from prison and saying, hey guys, I got the stuff you sent me because they sent him some stuff while he was in prison and he said, I got the stuff, Epaphroditus, which was one of their members, brought it down there. And he said, hey, I got the stuff that you brought me. And man, is it a blessing to me. You just don't know how much, boy, that stuff you sent me encourages me. And I'm going to tell you something. One of these days, I know God's going to deliver me. I'm going to be out of here. I'm going to come see you, and we're going to rejoice together. And he said, I want to come see you, but the Lord might want me to come home. You know, he said, I get kind of caught up between the two which is the greatest uh, that I should do. And anyway, all of that kind of stuff is going on. And, and, and this is the letter. The book of Philippians is the letter that the apostle Paul wrote to, a, to the church at Philippi. And, uh, and, and he's encouraging them. He, he's telling them things that are encouraging about what it means to be a Christian and about what the Christian life is all about and how to handle things, how to deal with conflict and people and, and circumstances and when things don't go right, how to look at it in a better light. And, 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 and we've spent, as a matter of fact, this is the fourth message in this. It'll probably be about like a 12 message, 13, something like that. Uh, we, this is our fourth message. And, and the first message was about how to, how to enjoy people in your life, you know, and it's just like you have to look at, you have to look at life in a different perspective and you have to realize God's not finished with them yet and you have to, you have to love from your heart and, and, you know, he just gives us some real good stuff about that and then how to enjoy life no matter what, you know, we looked at that and, 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 you know, you just have to throw away some things out of your life, conceit, your own agendas, and, you know, we just, it, it, just a lot of things like that. And today we come to, uh, to, to just some scriptures that are just about Jesus, uh -huh. some verses that are just about Jesus. It's not trying to tell you how to live a certain thing or how to get over a certain thing, but these verses just tell you about Jesus. As a matter of fact, this could be a Christmas message, actually, you know, it's because it's just about Jesus. It's about the coming of Christ. It's about why Jesus came, why God did this, why, what happened when he did it, why is that valuable to us, and, and then what do we do with, that, that, with, with the coming of Christ? So it's just, it's just a wonderful encouragement about Jesus in the song, the, the last song that our praise team say, you know, yeah, yeah. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I believe in the resurrection and life eternal. I believe, I mean, it fits beautifully because that's what these verses are about. It's about these things you can believe about Jesus. You know, it was a great day, and I wrote this in your notes. It was, it was a big day when when the Marines landed on the beach at Normandy. I mean, in World War II, the end, and uh, D-Day and all that stuff. Tremendous, man, that was a big day. It was a big day when America was discovered. It was a big day when the Apollo 11 orbiter landed on the moon and Neil Armstrong stepped off and said, one giant leap for man and <laughs> one small step. <laughs> no, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I mean, those are great, great things, but none of those compare even in a minuscule way with the time when God stepped out of heaven and put his foot here on this earth. Now, I can see some of you saying, I thought we were talking about Jesus. Well, we are talking about Jesus, but Jesus is God, right? So when Jesus put his foot on this earth, it was God putting his foot on this earth. 
And so God put his foot on this earth and said, all right, I'm here for you. He came for a particular reason. And so let's look at, let's just kind of jump in and see what these passages have to say. The first thing is the relevance of his coming. Why is it so important that he came? God came to this earth according to verse 6. Do I need to leave that up and let y'all write relevance down? <laughs> All right, there we go. The relevance, why is it important? Let's read verses 5 and 6. Look at this. All right, in your relationships with one another, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. All right, when you start getting along, you start doing things with each other, and you start coming to church together, and you start living life together, and you, you're all together, you're gonna, if, if, you, if it's going to last, you're going to have to have the same kind of mindset that Jesus had. That's right. And then he says, let me tell you what kind of mindset Jesus had. And he starts by saying, who, being in very form of God. In other words... Jesus was God. The word form, and I don't want to get too technical and, you know, scratchy for you, but the word form is the word morphe, a Greek word morphe. Uh, it means his attributes. It means he was, he was the exact likeness. He had the same attributes. He had the same uh, passions. He said everything was just like God, who being in the form of God... So Jesus is God, and he has all the attributes and all the tendencies and all the, uh, uh, the qualities of God, and yet because of that, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So when Jesus stepped on this earth, Jesus stepped on this earth as totally God. Let me ask you something. Did Jesus claim to be God? You know, I, I, a lot of times I've heard people, and seriously, now, a lot of times you hear people say, well, you know, I could really accept Jesus as being a great man. I mean, Jesus was a tremendous prophet. As a matter of fact, many of the religions of the world, the, you know, uh, that you could call out now the, uh, with uh, all kinds of belief systems, their, their belief system is Jesus actually existed. Jesus actually did come to this earth, but he was a great man. He came to earth as a great man and as a great prophet of God. But you have to remember that Jesus said he was God. You remember all over the New Testament? You're, uh, yeah, the woman at the well. The woman at the well sitting there, Jesus says, hey, you got six husbands and uh, uh, five husbands and the one you're living with now you're not married to. And she looked at him and said, I know one day that the Messiah is going to come. And when the Messiah comes, he's going to be able to tell us all these things. And what did Jesus say? I who speak to you. I am the Messiah. I am he that speaks to you. Philip, one of the own disciples, was there with the rest of the disciples in a group, and they were looking around, and Philip said to Jesus, uh, we would see God, Jesus. And what did Jesus say back to Philip? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. Yeah, Jesus claimed to be God all over the place. That's all he ever did. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld him as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Yeah, Jesus, Colossians said that everything on this earth was made by him and for him. So sure, Jesus claimed to be God. That's all he did is claim to be God. That's why he was crucified, because he claimed to be God. As a matter of fact, on his cross, they put a little emblem on his cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And the Jews said, take that off and put, he says he's the King of the Jews. They said, this man is a blasphemer. This man claims to be God. We can't have somebody going around attracting hundreds of thousands of people, whole mountainsides full of people to his cause claiming to be God? Come on, man. A good man, yeah. A great man, yeah. A prophet, yeah. A wonderful rabbi, yeah. A teacher, yeah. yeah. But God? This guy claims to be God? That's blasphemy. He's got to die because he claims to be God. And that's why they put him to death. That was the charge. That's the charge the Jews had against Jesus. He claims to be God. Now, I preach to you and I say to you, this is what God says. 
I read the Bible, I pray, and I say to you, every Sunday or whenever I speak to you, I say, let me tell you what God says. And you might look at me and you say, Pastor Keith is a good man because he tells us what God says. And we believe that he's a good man because he knows God and he's truthful with us. But the first time that I look at you and I say, I am God, oh, then you'll walk out the door, right? Yep. And you should walk out the door and I'll go with you. Um, <laughs> Because I have trouble, now, now follow my logic now, I have trouble believing that Jesus is a good man if he's not God. Because if he's not God, he said he was God. Would a good man say he was God and not be God? Would a good man lie to you like that? Would a good man deceive you like that? So Jesus is either who he says he is, God or he's a lunatic. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. So if you're talking about, the, it, would it be relevant? Would it be relevant to your life if God stepped out of heaven and stepped down here on this earth to live among us? Would that be relevant in our lives? Sure it would, man. So and, and, why did Jesus come? It's a, the relevance of, of, of the coming of Christ. All right, let's move on. All right. The reality of his coming. Why did he come? The fact that he did is he stepped out of heaven, stepped on earth, and he was in the form of God, and yet he didn't try to act big bossy, and he didn't try to highlight himself, and he didn't try to take advantage, and he didn't try to pull rank by saying, okay, I'm going to do a bunch of stuff you can't do because I'm God. That's what, that's what not taking advantage of it means. When Jesus was here, people had trouble uh, believing he was God because they didn't see him walking around uh, with lightning bolts coming out of his head and uh, thunder, you know, speaking out of his voice and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. That, that Cecil B. DeMille picture of God, you know, the Ten Commandments kind of picture of God. Yeah, he looked normal. And so, and so Jesus came looking normal and looking like a man, but he was really God. Now, now look at verse 7. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. What does that mean? He looks like a man, right? Am I, am I reading that wrong? He was born, he looked like a man. So there go all your halos, guys. Jesus didn't walk around with a halo over his head and everybody watching him and saying, ooh, that's somebody from God. No, the Bible says Jesus looked just like everybody else. He looked just like a common person walking around, no halo, no wings, no sword in his hand, you know, no blood coming out of him. You know, I mean, no, he looked just like a regular man walking on this earth. Look at what it says. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus was walking around. The reality of Jesus is that he actually really actually came to this earth as a real flesh and blood, tissue and bones human being that you could feel and touch and see. As a matter of fact, after the, even after the resurrection, uh, some of the disciples had trouble believing it was him. They said, this is a ghost. A, and he said, here, touch me, feel me, man. Come on, give me a piece of that fish. And he ate the fish. And, and, and they didn't even see it inside of him, you know, like he was see-through or anything. Would a, and Jesus said, would a spirit eat? Come on, come Man, this is real flesh and blood right here is what I'm trying to say to you. I'm just saying to you that Jesus is not a story. He's not a phantom. He's not a ghost. He's not some image. He's not some cosmic uh, cloud that floats around up there somewhere. Yeah. Jesus Christ is real flesh and blood, just like me and you. And, and he stepped on this earth and was just like you and I. When, if you were God, would you come to this earth born as a baby? The most innocent, helpless creature that ever exists? Guys, look, I'm going to tell you something. Humanity, human beings are at the top of the ladder as far as as the, as the apple of God's eye. He says that. I mean, we, we were created in the image of God. There's no creation higher than humanity. And yet, look at our, look at our offspring. Yeah. 
Look at how helpless they are. Look at how innocent they are. They could not survive without us. In other words, God created us to have such a fragile start in life that if we didn't have parents, we would never make it. We would die. We can't feed ourselves. We can't find water. We can't do it. We can't protect ourselves. We can't. I mean, we are totally, totally helpless when we are born on this earth. And yet God comes. Now, listen, I mean, you, you heard me on, on uh, Easter. I preached on sneaky Jesus. You remember that? And talked to you about how sneaky Jesus is, you know? Well, Jesus is, Jesus is so sneaky, he came to earth under the guise, uh, I mean, he's the king of the world, he's the king of creation, he's the, he's the long-awaited Messiah, the one that the Jews, I mean, falsely, they thought this, they thought he was going to deliver them from Roman bondage. I mean, they thought, okay, he, Jesus is going to make Rome quit making fun of us and quit, and quit being prejudiced against us. Uh, that's what they thought, but that's not why he came, but that's what they thought. But here, but here he is. He couldn't, he, he couldn't come as a, as a conqueror. He couldn't come as a warrior, as a fighter. He couldn't come as a full-blown, full-grown human being to, to, to wrestle against the powers that are here on this earth. He came in the back door. Everybody say, sneaky Jesus. Sneaky Jesus didn't come to a palace somewhere. Sneaky Jesus came to a manger on the hillside in a little tiny place where they placed him in swaddling clothes and laid him in that manger. And Jesus grew up just like us. The only thing the Bible says about Jesus growing up now, and this is a fact, I mean, the only thing between the time Jesus was birthed, and, you know, they had to change Jesus' diapers. They had to give Jesus formula. They had to, they had to, they had to nurture him. They had to, they, had to, they had to pamper him. They had to pet him. He had colic and, 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 and all the other little junk that we have, you know, and, and, and that was Jesus. That's the Son of God. I mean, he didn't have a halo and, and all of a sudden just hovered all all over the place and, and, and fed himself and just took care of business and all that like some kind of little idol or something. He was a real flesh and blood baby born right there where everybody has to take care of the baby. Did we remember Jesus? Somebody go back and get Jesus. We got Jesus. And the, and it, and, and the Bible says the only thing about him in his, in his childhood life was that, that he grew in wisdom and stature and found favor with God and men. That's all it says about Jesus. He grew in wisdom and height, stature, and he found favor, which means he got along with people. He was not a punk. He was not a delinquent. He was not a troublemaker. He got along with people, and he found favor with God his father, and with the people he was sent to minister to. And remember, Jesus never identified himself until he got, until he was 30 years old and started his ministry. He never one time when he was a kid said, hey man, I'm Jesus, let me pick the team. I mean, he never one time, you know, uh, uh, took over a marble game somewhere and got everybody's marble and said, don't you wish you were like me, I'm God, you know. Or you got to let me win because after all, I come from heaven. <laughs> you know, no, Jesus grew up just like us, man. I mean, how would you like to be the brother or sister of Jesus? Because, you know, he did have brothers and sisters. I hate to break uh, some religion's heart. Some religions call Mary the blessed virgin. She's not a virgin. No, not forever. That's right. She had a bunch of brothers and sisters. And how would you like to grow up with brothers and sisters and you're Jesus? And Jesus, and they're trying to play games, and you're trying to, and they're trying to interject, and they're trying to have it, and and, and 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 you're Jesus, but you can't tell anybody because it's not time to tell anybody. And so Jesus goes through all of his life up until 30 years old, and then all of a sudden, at 32 years old, he began. At 30 years old, he just he began to identify the fact that he was Jesus. So he was born like us. Everybody say sneaky Jesus. He grew up like us. Sneaky Jesus. He, he, he was tempted like us. You remember when he got first in his ministry, the first thing that happened is he got taken out to a desert and, and he was taken out there for the express purpose of the enemy tempting him in the, in the wilderness. And the devil came to him 
And the devil said, man, you're hungry, aren't you? And Jesus said, oh, yeah, I'm hungry. Huh? Well, command that these stones be made bread. And he could have done it. He could have said, all right, stone, you no longer stone your bread. Come on, all right. He could have done that. But Jesus didn't do that. You know why? Because we can't do that. He said, I'm not going to do stuff you can't do. I'm going to show you how to do stuff you're supposed to do in the right way. And what Jesus did, he took the book of Deuteronomy and he quoted a verse out of that. And he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And, and it was like stabbing the devil, you know, like the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the devil, you know, but he's pretty quick on his feet. So he came back and he, and took, and he took Jesus up on the pinnacle of a temple. And he said, now, look out, look, at, look, look out down, down there, all those people. You see them all down there, they're looking at you. And if you'll just throw yourself off of this temple and you'll hit the ground, but it won't kill you because the angels will catch you. You know they will. You know the angels. You know God, and he's not going to let you get hurt. He's not even going to let you stump your toe against a stone walking down the road. So you don't have anything to fear, and if you do that, everybody will know that guy is Superman. That guy is God. That guy is somebody to be followed. Think of the temptation of that, the pride. Think about, man, that sounds like a good idea. Boy, I could just impress everybody all at one time. Wouldn't have to walk around teaching things and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I could just, everybody could just say, oh, Jesus. And, but Jesus didn't do that. Jesus looked at him and took Deuteronomy again and said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Shoot, stab the devil again, you know. But the devil, he's got another trick up his sleeve and he takes him out and he shows him, uh, he shows him this vast expanse of place. And he said, if you'll just get down and worship me, I'll give you every bit of this, all of this stuff out here. And Jesus said, Jesus said, uh, uh, no, he took a book of Deuteronomy again. <laughs> and, he, and he said, uh, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, and him only shall you serve. And I'm just telling you, amen, I'm just telling you that if Jesus can take three verses out of Deuteronomy, you and I ought to be able to take the whole word of God and combat the evil in our life. But I'm just saying to you that he was tempted just like we are. So we really, we really cannot ever truly say nobody understands how I feel. Because he understands, he went through every temptation that you'll ever go through in your life, and even more than you went through. Because you remember, he never yielded to temptation. He just went, he went to levels of temptations that you and I would never make it to. You know why? Because we would give up before we got to those levels. I mean, there's a level of temptation that I can't pass by. It's too much for me. It's too strong for me. And God says, you know, that, that, that when we get to that kind of level in Corinthians, he said, I'm going to make the way of escape for you. He says, I'm not going to let you be tempted more than you're able to bear but with the temptation, I'll make a way of escape. Now, he didn't say you weren't ever going to go over the level. He just said, you're not going over the level without a way to get out of it. If you'll take that way out, I'm giving you a way out. Yeah. The trouble with us is we don't take the way out. We go on, with the we go on and, and fall off the cliff. But we got a way out, and Jesus will give us a way out. I mean, just about the time you're ready to make your move in the office, and she's willing, and you're willing, and it's all hot and bothered and everything, all of a sudden the phone rings, and it's, hey, honey, just thinking about you today. What's going on down there at work? That's your way out. There, there is Jesus talking in your ear saying, hey, you're going above the level of your temptation. Here's the way out. Take it. I'm sorry, hon, I got to take this call. <laughs> and, you, and, and you extricate yourself of the situation. See, I'm just saying when the Bible in the book of Hebrews says that we have, we have not a high priest who is not touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. And I'm just saying that Jesus knows how you feel. He knows what you're going through, and he knows the levels that you've never made it to because you yielded before you got to them. Yeah. Man, imagine how tough those levels are. If the ones get you are down here, imagine, how, how, imagine what one up there would be like. Oh, my goodness, man. So Jesus was you know, born like us. He grew up like us. He tempted like us, and he suffered like us. 
I mean, Jesus cried. Jesus was tired. Jesus got hungry. Jesus, Jesus, you know, his feelings got hurt. He wept over his friends dying. I mean, Jesus, you know, he, he, he suffered like us. So you, you can't say nobody knows how I feel. And I'm just saying that the reality, the reality according to Philippians is that he emptied himself and he was born in the likeness of a man and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. And Jesus was in every way human like us. That's the God we serve. When we say, I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe in life everlasting and the resurrection and all that stuff, it's because Jesus really did come. He really did step his foot on this earth and he really did go through all the stuff that the Bible says he went through in order for us to have a change in life. Let me give you the third thing, the reason for his coming. Why did it happen? Why did Jesus go through all of this stuff? Why did God have this kind of plan and arrangement? Why did this happen? Look at verse 8, the, the end of it. I'm going to read 7 and 8 again just to flow into it, but, but you'll see. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. Here it is. He humbled himself. This is why he came. Yeah. This is why he came. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Amen. Yeah, that deserves a happy hallelujah. Yeah. The reason Jesus came is it, it, it's going to sound, it's going to sound uh, oddly odd to human reasoning, but the reason Jesus came is Jesus came to die. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus came to die. Yes, a couple of evidences right off the bat told you that. One, swaddling clothes. Mm -hmm. Swaddling clothes, and, and, and I know you'll be looking this up, you know, and I've, I've looked everywhere in the world to try to find what I, I know to be true, but I can't find it. If you do, please let me know. But I read historians when I was in school, and, and, and there were some that believed that swaddling clothes were actually burial clothes that swaddling clothes were actually burial clothes. They were clothes that people were placed into to be buried. That's why it was a sign. It wouldn't be a sign for a baby wrapped up in regular blankets. All babies wrapped up in regular blankets. But a sign would be wrap a baby in a burial cloth. Then when you see that, you'll know, uh-oh, that one's different. Now, I can't prove that, so don't say that to Jesus when you get to heaven, all right? Don't, don't say, well, you know what? My pastor said you were born and wrapped up in burial cloths, and they're going to say, he's going to say, where did you get that idea? But, but whether or not, I mean, you can, well, you'll know. <laughs> you'll know because Corinthians says, when I see Jesus face to face, I will know as I am known. What does he know about you? Everything. What are you going to know? Everything. I've heard people say, I'm going to ask Jesus. No, you're not. Because you're going to already know, <laughs> you know, you're going to know. But anyway, anyway, swaddling clothes, I'm, and I'm just saying that, and I'm putting a little, you know, I'm putting a little brackets around that, so don't rest your eternity on it. But it seems to me that there had to be something different about them because the, they, the angels told the shepherds, go and you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. That was a sign. That, that, it was so they would know. So it had to be something unusual about them or else it wouldn't be a sign. I mean, every baby's wrapped up in, you know, baby clothes and blankets and blah, blah, blah. But here's the real big one, and this one just can't be argued with at all. When the, when the, when the, when the wise men came, by the way, and I might as well just go ahead and, and, and try to pop everybody's little uh, bubbles uh, right here. The wise men did not come to the manger. So if you've got a nativity scene with the wise men, get them out of it. It's ignorant. They did not come there. Read the Bible. The Bible says that Jesus was a young child by the time the wise men got there. They came to the house where the young child was. That's what the Bible says. So he's at least two years old. And you say, how do you know? Well, because Herod was killing all the babies two years old and under. Because he had heard about this Messiah. And, and so, according to Herod, it could have been as many as two years ago this baby was born. So he started killing all the babies that were two years old and under. That's why Joseph took Jesus and Mary and fled to Egypt. You, you guys know about that? Anyway, anyway uh, but, but my point is, my point is that when the wise men came, what did they bring him? They brought him gold, which was for a king. 
They gave him frankincense, which was an incense, a sweet-smelling spice flavor incense for anointing. And myrrh. Myrrh is a burial ointment. Myrrh is what you, they anoint you with when they put you in a tomb somewhere. So from the very start of his life, the people around him noticed that by giving him things that were meant for his death. Jesus came to die on this earth. Um, amazingly, and he, and, he, and he still came through. He still came through with it. There are two reasons why Jesus came, you know, you say, okay, he came to die. Uh, what's that all about? Two, two, two reasons that Jesus was here. Oh, let me tell you, two, two, two reasons. Okay. Two reasons Jesus was here. Number one, to demonstrate to us how much God loves us. All right, all right. You know, the Bible says in the most famous passage in the whole world, John three sixteen, it says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's God's only begotten son, by the way. These other religions that claim, you know, that he had some brothers of Jesus and and they got to be the devil, that's just hogwash. He is the only begotten son of God. Now, you and I are sons of God by adoption, but we're not begotten sons of God. Natural born, for real, by God, God's hand, you know, Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So why did, God, why did Jesus come? Why did, why did God carry through with this kind of coming to die stuff to demonstrate the fact that he loves us more than we love ourselves? And I submit that is true because I'm going to ask you, how many of you would give your child to die for somebody like you? You know you, right? You know what kind of rascal you are and what kind of person you are. And you know you've done stuff you said you'd never do. And you've gone back on your word and you've said things and you've dishonored things and you've done all kinds of things. Now I'm going to just ask you, would you let your child die for somebody like you? I wouldn't. Now, I might die for somebody like me, but not let my son die or my daughter die for somebody like me. No, no, that's horse of a different color right there. And yet, here's Jesus coming and dying for rascals like us to demonstrate how deeply God loves us. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, in in, in the book of Romans 3, it says, um, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. Yeah, he's talking about you. Yeah, I'm talking about everybody in this room, including myself. I'll double myself. All of us are sinners, guys. That's just a fact. We are sinners by birth. We're sinners by nature, and we're sinners by choice. We were born with polluted blood from Adam all the way down through the centuries. We choose to sin because sin is fun, and we like it. And that's our nature as human beings is to push the limits and sin. So we need a Savior. Yeah. So what does God do? Well, the wages of sin is death, the, the next verse in Romans, in Romans 5, uh, uh, 3, 23. For the wages of sin is death. In other words, what are wages, guys? Wages are what you get paid for what you do, right? right. I mean, when I go to work and I work eight hours, I get wages, wages. payment for eight hours of work. So that verse says the wages of sin, and we've already said we're sinners, the what we deserve, what we've earned, give me my paycheck, I deserve death. I've earned death, eternal separation from God, not heaven when I die, but eternal separation from God forever because that's what I have earned by the life I have lived. And yet here's God in the next half of that verse, but for the wages of sin is death, and then there's a big butt right in the middle of it. I love big butt. <laughs> but there's a big butt <laughs> right, right in the middle of it. But, and what do big butts do? Change things. But the gift of God 
is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah. In other words, right? Yeah, right? When I deserve what I'm getting, I have earned it. I, I, that's what my life has purchased, and I'm getting the wages of what I deserve in life. God stops me from getting those wages and gives me something I don't deserve, which is eternal life. And it comes through that one that came in human form and gave himself and died on a cross and bled and suffered and gave himself for every one of us. That's why God said, go down there and show them how much we love them, son. And Jesus came. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, 5, but God commends, which means God shows. God shows his love for us, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 8 of Romans. But God commends his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not when, yeah, not when we were good enough to go to heaven, not when we were at our best, not when we were playing the A side of our life. When we were playing the, the B, C, D, E, and F side of our life, you know, those sides that you're on the back of the record where nobody hears any of it, you know, we always want the A side. By the way, Facebook is A side, if you ever wondered about that. Everybody on Facebook, everything's A side. It's the side everybody wants you to see. That's what they, 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 they present. Okay, that's, that, that's, that's my best. Yeah, that's my best. I want you to see my best. And this, is, and this is me at my best. Well, God says, when you were at your worst, when you were dirty, nasty, filthy, laying, rolling around in a ditch, couldn't take care of yourself, didn't deserve to go to heaven when you die, rotten, stinking, polluted human being, at that point, Jesus Christ reached down and picked your sorry self up and gave you eternal life. That is what Jesus came for, to show us how much God loves us. And so Jesus came to give us a picture of what God believes about our life. I looked at a billboard one time uh, going down the highway, and I'm sure there's some around Hasburg, different places like that. It's a big, giant billboard. It had Jesus on a cross like this and had his hand stretched out and had those nails stretched in his hand, and right above it, it says, God loves you this much. Yeah. I saw that little, I saw a t-shirt in Brownsville Revival down in Pensacola. Uh, this bunch of goth, these about, about five or six teenagers with that goth, you know, black stuff and white face paint and all that black lipstick and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and they walked by me in the church. Now, I mean, hey, there's all, God has all kinds of people now. No, I mean, no, make no mistake. Make no mistake. You might think goth people go to hell. No, I'm telling you, there's some Christian goths. But anyway... But anyway, they came down the aisle, and on, on the front of their T-shirt, it had, I mean, you know, when they got those piercings, they got those eyes things, and the piercing all up in the nose, everything, and, and, and I, I was looking at them, and I was watching them go by, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm, what I'm really thinking is, that has to be painful. That's what I'm really thinking, <laughs> and, uh, and, and on the front of the T-shirt, I saw it said, body piercing saved my life. And I look in that T-shirt, when he walked by on the back of that T-shirt, there was Jesus hanging on the cross with those nails pierced in through his hand, body pierced and saved my life. I thought, glory to God, what a tribute to Jesus. You know? so, 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 so he came to show us the love of God, to demonstrate it, and he came to pay for my sin. Because my sin has to be paid for, guys. You know, we talk about the justice of God. The justice of God demands that sin be paid for. Somebody's got to pay. Yeah. So what Jesus did is he said, I'll pay. Mm -hmm. I'll pay for them. And his blood was shed to pay for my sin and your sin. And just to show you that that was not an accident. I, I, I get, you know, sometimes I hear people talking and I just get, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, do they know what they're talking about? Because they talk about the Old Testament as if somehow that was God's wrong deal that he finally wised up and said, well, you know, that's not working. I got to do something else. Jesus, come here. I mean, that's the way they talk about the Bible and God. But I'm going to tell you, it was God's plan all along that Jesus would come and die. You know why? Why? Because the Old Testament is filled up with examples of it. 
you know, in prophecy, and not only prophecies, but, but services and stuff they did. Like when they said, all right, you, every year you're going to have to go out and you've got to find the best bull you have on the farm. And you're going to have to kill him. And the best now, don't give me your little raggedy three-legged sheep and stuff like that. Don't give me, you know, a little sick cow or something or another like that, a colicky. And, you get me the best you have. The most perfect one you have. You get the biggest, the best, the most virile, the greatest one out there, and you kill him, and you drain his blood out of him, and you bring that blood, and you pour that blood on this pile of coals here, and let that smoke ascend up into the nostrils of God to make sacrifice for your sins. And then next year, we'll do the same thing. And the next year we'll do the same thing because that blood of animals is not actually paying for your sin. It's just postponing the judgment. It just pushes it off for one more year. You don't pay up next year, you fall it under judgment. You pay up every year, your sins get covered every year, puts off to the next year, puts off to the next year, puts off to the next year. Jesus came and shed his blood as the innocent lamb of God so that once and for all, our bill will be paid. Not pushed forward to be paid one day, but the bill was taken care of by the blood of Jesus, just like God planned it from the time Adam and Eve were on this earth and before. God had a plan before he even created the earth. And it always involved Jesus. That wasn't God's way to try to cover up some mess up he did or something he couldn't get worked out right or the humans were so surprising that he, they surprised God at how wicked. No, 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 no. No, God had that planned all along. And so, and then last, here's the last thing, the result. So what? Okay, he came, yep, he really came, yep. Why'd he come? Show us God loves and to pay for our sin. And, uh, so what? So what? Look at verse 9. Therefore, now, you never begin a conversation with the word therefore, do you, right? I mean, you wouldn't just walk up to somebody and say, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You wouldn't walk up to somebody and say, well, uh, therefore, uh, <laughs> you know, because what, what they would say is, what is, what, therefore, what is therefore? I mean, something came before that I don't know what is there for, there for. You know, when you see a there for, what's it there for? Well, yeah, all right. So in other words, I'm just saying this to you that verse nine is based on everything that's come before. That's what. Everything that God has said before verse nine, now verse nine is there based on everything that he's just got through saying. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus came to this earth, born in a little child, went through life, suffered everything, went through all kinds of temptation, went to the cross, uh, beaten, spat upon, crucified on the cross, laid his life down, said it is finished, gave up the ghost, went through the resurrection, went back and sat down by God and, 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 and lost it all. No, no, no. I mean, what? All right, Jesus left the earth. He's no more. He lost it, everything. No, no. Because Jesus did that, God gave him a name, a new name, yeah, yeah. an exalted name. Let me just deal with the names that are up there, okay? The name, the Greek form of Jesus is Eosus. Eosus. E A I S U S, something. Like and, and it's an E, and the E and the A are long. Eosus is the way you pronounce it. <laughs> there were lots of people named Eosus, lots of people in the Bible named Eosus. Jesus is a very common name, right? There are people today named Jesus, right? Jesus, Joshua. Joshua is the Hebrew form of Jesus. Yeah, and some are just Jesus, right, Nathan? Some are just Jesus, simply Jesus. Eosus is Greek. And, and, it, and, and Eosus means uh, God is coming. Or God is, no, excuse me, God is salvation. Eosus means God is salvation. So when you name your child Eosus, it means you believe God is a God of salvation. Okay, so anybody can be named Eosus. It was his name. That's what the angel said to name him. Name him Eosus, and he shall save his people from their sin. 
And then attached to Isis is another Greek word right there that says Christ, which is the Greek word Christos. So he is Isis Christos. He is God of salvation, Messiah. Christos means Messiah. So his name is Isis Christos. Jesus the Messiah. But when he went through all that we just described him going through, look at what God did. God said, because you have done all of this, I'm going to give you a name that is above every name, not a little common Eosis, not even a common Eosis Christ. I'm going to give you a name that is highly exalted above every other name, and now his name is, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Curios. Curios. You know what curios means? It means master. It means boss man. It means Mr. Big. It means the one who holds all control in his hands. So because Jesus did all that Jesus did, God said, you've earned the right to not just be called Iesus and not be called Iesus Christos, but be called Iesus Christos Curios. You are the ruler of the world. You are the manager of everything. You are the holder of every life. You are the determiner of what happens on this earth and in this cosmos and in this existence because you're Mr. Big. Nobody bigger than you, Jesus, because of what Jesus did. So what? Well, the so what is, that's why he came. And what are you doing with that? I mean, he came for you. Yeah, yeah. He did all this for you. Yeah. This is why all this happened for you. He became curious. He became Lord so that he could change you and me. Now, I'm going to tell you what. I have asked Christ to come into my life and be my Savior. I have waved the white flag and said, I surrender. I give it up. Yeah, yeah. And I don't have any kind of peace treaty either. I mean, it's not like, okay, I'm going to give it up and you're going to give me $20 million. You know. <laughs> no, I'm giving it up and, 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 and I'm hoping you won't kill me. You know what I mean? That's why I'm, I'm waving the white flag. This is the truth. This is the truth. You know, I give it up. You're too powerful. You're too strong. And I've asked Christ to come into my life yeah. because that's why Jesus came. That's why he did all of this stuff, to, to, to pay for my sin, to, to, to get rid of that out of my life, to change me forever. That's why Jesus came. And I'm just asking you, uh, what you going to do with that? Have you done anything with that? Is that what you've appropriated into your life? Jesus, I'm... This is, what, this is what I need. This is what I receive. I'm yours right now. Have you ever done that? Because if you haven't, let me tell you what you're trying to do. What you're trying to do is you're trying to pile your life up. You're trying to pile the good part of your life over here and the bad part of your life over here. And you're trying to make those piles even out. Or maybe get a few more good ones than bad ones. As if somehow God's going to grade your life on the curve, you know. <laughs> okay, well, it's more than 50%. So okay, we're that bad. No, no. May I say that's foolishness. It's dangerous. Yeah, yeah. One, one of the things, and I'm, I'm going to quit with this, y'all. I know y'all what. When I, was, when I was in my first year of college in the summer, uh, I was called by the Mississippi Baptist Convention Board, and they asked if I would come be a counselor at an RA camp, which RA stands for Royal Ambassadors. It's like Christian Boy Scouts. And, um, and, and so I said, yes, I'll do it. And so for six weeks, I had to go to um, uh, Jackson and Hattiesburg, two big, like Paul Johnson State Park, and they had, they had teams of boys that would come, like hundreds of them, and they'd stay in cabins, and then we'd have to teach them and take care of them and do all that kind of stuff. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, I'm tw like 20 years old. And, um, and I don't really care about, about them too much. But, but anyway, it, it was, uh, I, anyway, I harassed. I, I was horrible to them. Uh, 
God forgive me. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, one of the first things, one of the first things that they taught us when we got when the counselors, all of us, it was about like 10 of us. When we got there, the first thing they taught us was water safety, how to be a lifeguard because there was a pool. And I guess they thought that's the most dangerous thing at this camp. So we need to teach every counselor how to be a lifeguard. And so they put us in training to be a lifeguard. And let me tell you what I learned. The first thing and the biggest thing that you need to know if you're going to be a lifeguard. You cannot rescue somebody who is still fighting for themselves. If you jump out there and try to rescue somebody who is struggling and trying to stay above water, they are going to drown you. They're going to drown you. <laughs> yeah, that's good, Nathan. Nathan said, punch them in the face and knock them out. <laughs> that's good. But you're not, gonna, you're not going to rescue somebody who is still trying to rescue themselves. So put that in your life. God can't save you if you're still trying to save yourself. If you'll quit fighting and let him hold you, he will get you to the shore and you will be saved. Let's bow.